All right, here for this next screencast, we're gonna be looking at the cross section of the spinal cord. And there are histological features listed on page 61, as well as some other features on page 62 related to the gross anatomy of the spinal cord. And so this is gonna look at one slide here and then a couple models that we have in lab for you to look at. And so when we look at the cross section of the spinal cord, the, the first thing to notice is the, the arrangement of the gray and the white matter. And so the gray matter is this structure here. This is almost looks like a butterfly. And then surrounding it is gonna be the white matter. And the difference here has to do with what, what's making up those two regions. The white matter, this is myelinated axons. And so remember that the myelin sheath is that layering of the plasma membrane of, of a Schwann cell, or in the case of the central nervous system, these things called oligodendrocytes. Um, and, and so the myelin itself is going to be lipid rich, right? It's gonna have a lot of those phospholipids in there. And so that gives it this white appearance. And these axons, these axons are either gonna be running down from the brain, or they're gonna be running up through the spinal cord up towards the brain. And so here we can think of this long distance transport through these myelinated axons. Whereas the gray matter, this is where you're gonna find the cell bodies of neurons, which are gonna contain a lot of nissel bodies, which is gonna give it that kind of darker appearance. You'll also find inner neurons, as well as unmyelinated axons. And so the gray matter is gonna be containing, again, the cell bodies, as well as these unmyelinated axons, um, in, in addition to the glial cells that we've learned about that are helping support these neurons. And more specifically, the, the gray matter can be divided up into these different horns. And so first off, on the posterior side, we have these posterior horns. And you'll notice that these two posterior horns extend all the way out to the surface of the spinal cord. And that's a very nice feature to identify because it helps you determine which side is posterior. Sometimes it's not very obvious, but you'll notice that the posterior horns continue all the way out to the surface, where down here on the bottom, the anterior ones do not. These posterior horns, these are going to be associated with the sensory neurons. And so sensory information is going to be coming in through the dorsal surface of the spinal cord. And it's in here that you'll find cell bodies of sensory neurons, you'll find inner neurons, but we want to associate the posterior or the dorsal horns with the sensory nervous system. Whereas the anterior horns, these are going to be associated with the motor neurons. And so in here, we're gonna find cell bodies of motor neurons, which will then send axons out the anterior surface into these roots and eventually out into the nerves. And so the anterior horn is gonna be associated with the motor neurons, specifically the somatic motor or the motor involved with our skeletal muscles. And so the gray matter itself is divided up into these two regions. And as we'll see, there's actually also a third region, the lateral horns that becomes more apparent depending on where in the spinal cord you're looking. The last feature of the gray matter to point out here is this, what's referred to as the gray commissure. This is this area of gray matter that connects the two halves. You can see that it goes around the central canal there. And so this last bit of gray matter that connects the two halves, this is that gray commissure. And then in the middle, as we've seen before, is the central canal, and that's gonna be lined with those ependymal cells, and it's gonna be filled with cerebral spinal fluid. The other thing that you can see here are the various regions of the white matter. And so the white matter is divided up into these different regions referred to as columns. And so we have the posterior columns, the anterior columns, as well as the lateral columns. And so we have these three different columns that make up the white matter, as well as then the horns that make up the gray matter. In addition, we can start to see the roots. And so these roots here, these are gonna contain the axons of either sensory neurons coming back into the spinal cord, which is true on the posterior side, or the axons of motor neurons leaving the spinal cord, which is true for the anterior surface. And so we have these posterior roots up here, and then we have the anterior roots here. Um, the other thing you'll notice here is that the posterior root has this big swollen area, and this is gonna be that dorsal or posterior root ganglion. And you'll see them on both sides. And so we've looked at slides of this dorsal root ganglion because that's where we find the cell bodies of unipolar or sensory neurons. And it's also where we found all of the satellite cells surrounding those cell bodies. And so again, the unipolar neurons are associated with sensory 
And so here's where the cell bodies of those sensory neurons tend to be. And then running through this posterior route would be the axons carrying that information back to the central nervous system. If we take a look at this model, this is a very important model for you to note, we can see those same features. We can see the posterior gray horns, the anterior gray horns. We can also see then at label 37 here, these lateral horns. And in certain parts of the spinal cord, specifically the thoracic region and some of the lumbar region, we have these very prominent lateral horns. And the lateral horns are associated with motor neurons, but specifically motor neurons involved in the autonomic or that involuntary nervous system we've talked about. And so lateral horns are going to also contain cell bodies of motor neurons, but these are going to be motor neurons associated with the autonomic nervous system. And they're only going to be found in certain parts of the spinal cord, specifically the thoracic um, region and a little bit of the, the lumbar. We can also see the various roots. So here's that posterior or dorsal root. Here's the dorsal root ganglion. And then here's the ventral root. As these roots come together, here labeled 20 on this model, this is now referred to as the spinal nerve. And so a spinal nerve is a bundle of axons, some of which are sensory, carrying information back to the spinal cord, and others are motor, which is gonna be carrying information away from the spinal cord. And you can see on the other side here, the same thing, it's all, it's all um, matched up on, on either side. In addition to those structures, on page 62, there are other features that we can start to see on this model that we couldn't see on, on, the, on the slide before. And, and particularly, it's these meningeal layers, these protective uh, connective tissue layers that support and surround the spinal cord. And so on your list here, um, three of them are actual layers, and then three of them are spaces between or outside those layers. And so the three layers that make up the meninges are on the outer one right here, the dura matter. Just inside that is the arachnoid layer. And then the innermost one, the one that's directly in contact with the spinal cord, this is the pia matter. And it would be true all around. So here's the pia, outside that's the arachnoid, and then just outside that is going to be the dura matter. And these are connected tissue layers that are gonna help protect and support the, the spinal cord. Importantly, there are also then spaces or potential spaces outside or between these layers. And the first one here, this, this adipose rich layer that has a lot of blood vessels, this is the epidural space. And so again, here's the dura matter. So outside that is the epidural space. And this is a true space when it comes to the spinal cord. Below the dura is the subdural space. And so you can see this very fine line, this brown line. This line is really representing the subdural space, which truthfully is not a space. In the body, the arachnoid layer is directly, directly touching the dura layer. And so in the body, that space doesn't really exist. Um, but in, in sometimes in the slide prep and in the prosection room, that space forms as these layers come apart. Most importantly though, we then have this layer that's between the arachnoid layer and the pia. And that's referred to as the subarachnoid space. And this space, as you can see, is going to contain the roots and the rootlets. It's gonna be filled with cerebral spinal fluid. It's also gonna contain blood vessels that are gonna help nourish the spinal cord itself. And so the subarachnoid space is this nice prominent space that's gonna be filled with the cerebral spinal fluid um, that, that's just between the arachnoid layer and the pia layer. Some other things that we can see on this model, we can see that there are these two grooves, one on the anterior surface and another on the posterior surface. The one on the anterior tends to be a little bit wider and deeper, and this is going to be the um, anterior medial, median fissure. So the anterior median fissure, and, and that's why it's important to be able to determine that this is the anterior surface, right? Again, those anterior horns do not extend all the way to the surface. And so that allows us to say for, for sure that this is the anterior median fissure. Whereas on the posterior side, not nearly as deep nor wide is going to be the posterior median sulcus, this very narrow groove that extends down on the posterior surface. This last figure uh, shows another one of the models that we have available for you in lab that you should be familiar with. And this is really showing the, the same features as the previous model. Um, it doesn't show the meninges, 
But what it, I think, is trying to emphasize more than anything is the various components of the gray matter. Again, there's the posterior or the dorsal horn, which is containing sensory. So another term used to describe sensory neurons are the afferent neurons. So wherever you see afferent, that's going to describe neurons that are sending information back towards the central nervous system. And so here we can see, again, those afferent or sensory neurons running in through the dorsal root ganglion, which is where those cell bodies are present, and then continuing through the dorsal root and entering then and synapsing here in that dorsal horn or the posterior horn. Whereas the anterior horn and the lateral horn, those are going to be containing carrying uh, motor neurons. And so as I mentioned before, the lateral horn specifically is the autonomic nervous system, or here they're describing as the visceral, and efferent is another term used for motor. And so efferent and motor can be used interchangeably. These are going to be neurons that are leaving, moving away from the central nervous system. And so here we can see that the cell body is then going to be, oops, sorry about that, present in, in the, the lateral horn, and it's going to send an axon out the anterior or ventral root, and eventually that's going to join the dorsal root to form the lateral nerve. And the anterior horn is going to have just general somatic efferent or our general somatic muscle um, motor neurons that are going to innervate primarily our skeletal muscles. There are also some features here that show that once the spinal nerve forms, so here we can see again that dorsal root and that ventral root joining together. This is that spinal nerve. Once these spinal nerves form, they're going to then branch themselves. And there are two main branches that extend off of the spinal nerve. And these are referred to as rami. There's the dorsal ramus. And so this first branch, the smaller branch that extends off the dorsal surface, this is the posterior or dorsal ramus. And this is gonna be carrying um, information neurons to the kind of posterior body wall. The other main branch, which here just looks like a continuation of that spinal nerve, this is going to be the anterior ramus. And this again is going to be carrying both sensory as well as motor neuron, um, particularly the axons, to the periphery. And so again, we have the roots which join to form the spinal nerve. Spinal nerves are mixed, meaning that they carry both sensory and motor. And those spinal nerves then branch off into these rami. There's a smaller posterior ramus that's going to go the posterior body wall. And then there's going to be the main anterior ramus that's going to continue off to the periphery. And that's going to go off depending on uh, where in the spinal cord it exits. Later on, we'll learn more about these other two branches. These are going to be involved in the sympathetic nervous system. Um, I won't say much more about them now other than that we'll come back to them and, and that's kind of going to help explain why this red branch here takes a little detour through this ganglion and we'll talk about what this ganglion is but this is involved in the sympathetic trunk um, which is not something that we, we've discussed yet in lecture and so hopefully this gives enough of an overview of these models to describe some of the different features as well as some of the organization that we see in the white and the gray matter um, this this whole system the nervous system is less about knowing what the structures are, but really understanding how these structures are integrated to be able to, to drive the various functions that the nervous system does, controlling and integrating these signals. And so being able to associate the different horns with the different functional aspects of the nervous system is very important. And so that would be the, the function of these regions as opposed to just knowing the names of them.